I'm Chamit, and uh, I will be talking about um, DevOps best practices. Uh, and uh, for that, I will be taking um, seven key areas, and uh, we will go through, um, we will take each area, and uh, um, I will tell you about the stories uh, that we've been going through and uh, the things that we learn along our journey so that uh, you can be beneficial uh, from our experience. So uh, these are the seven areas that uh, I was hoping to, uh, uh, I, I, I'm going to talk about. And uh, we'll be talking about like tools and technologies, how to pick tools, what are the things that you need to uh, consider when uh, selecting technologies and certain tools, automation, orchestration, maintenance, and monitoring security, backups, DR, and uh, finally, uh, the right mindset and the culture uh, that you can uh, have within your teams and organizations. Yeah, so let's start with tools and technologies. So how do you figure out tools and technologies? Let's assume we are, you are uh, starting off a project, and uh, how do you decide what tools to be used and uh, what are the areas that you focus on when picking up tools and technologies? So um, one key area would be that you got to know what you are doing. So you need to have a, like a sound understanding of what you want to build and uh, how it has, to, like how you should build it and basically the requirements and workflows and everything. So without having a proper understanding of what you're going to build, it's very difficult to pick right tools. I can tell you um, uh, a small example, I think uh, then you will, you will be able to understand what I'm trying to emphasize here. So let's assume, um, you want to build, uh, you want to do a deployment uh, on a virtualized environment. Say, um, if you are a provider like WSO2, then on a daily ba basis, we have to build environments on various uh, infrastructure platforms. So one, uh, today, I might have to do a deployment on AWS. And tomorrow, I might have to do a deployment on Azure. So likewise, so when, when, select, when selecting a technology, to template your uh, templating your deployment, if I pick uh, CloudWatch, uh, uh, CloudFormation, I will be stuck with AWS with that technology. If I use uh, any other technology that comes with Azure, uh, they don't have uh, that sort of a thing like Azure templates, let's take, then I will be stuck with Azure. But as a provider, it's not scalable for me or my team to learn multiple technologies that are tightly bound with uh, different providers. So I might have to go with some sort of a, I might have to like take a step back and go with, a, like pick a technology that abstracts those, uh, the infrastructure layer and provide a set of functionality, a tool that provides a set of functionalities that I can describe my deployment irrespective of, like uh, without uh, thinking too much of the, uh, the infrastructure service that I'm going to run my stuff on. So I'm templating my deployment in that abstract language and uh, and when I run it uh, against AWS, it will do the deployment on AWS. And I take the same piece of code and run it against Azure, it will do the deployment on Azure. So likewise. So there are technologies that do that, and we use a technology called Terraform for that, which abstracts out the infrastructure layer, and I can describe my deployment with Terraform. And uh, I can uh, run the, like, as a technology, I can reuse, uh, I can use uh, the same technology in Multiple, against multiple infrastructure service providers. And if you're writing tools, those tools, you have to make sure that you, those tools can work together. That means output of one tool can be an input to another tool. Do we have anyone who are familiar with um, HashiCorp? Anyone who are using HashiCorp technologies? Okay, we got one. So HashiCorp has uh, a nice set of tools, and uh, in, internally at WSO2, we are like, uh, so much dependent on these tools, and uh, they have a set of tools that you can uh, run, a, you can have like end-to-end -end DevOps cycle. Uh, for example, um, if you're running, if you're doing a deployment on a virtualized environment, then uh, you need to build an image. And there's a tool to build image, basically bake image. And there's another tool to template deployments, like I said, Terraform. So the uh, 
the image baking tool's output can be feeded directly into uh, the templating technology. So what, if you run, uh, run the whole thing together, uh, it, take, it goes to the first tool and it will bake the image following its instructions, and that gets feeded automatically to the second tool, which, which does the deployment actually, and it will use the image and do the deployment using that image. Likewise, it's always advisable to use tools that can be run together, and that enables you to do one-click deployments. So if you just uh, hit, the, uh, hit one button in your keyboard, and everything has to follow on until you get something running, and uh, until you get something, uh, something that you can actually use. And obviously, the tools has to provide stats and statuses, whether uh, the tool works successfully or not, whether it got deployed uh, what, you supposed to de what it's supposed to deploy, and how long it took to de do certain operations. Likewise, those stats are very useful uh, to improve, uh, improve your uh, story and uh, improve the service you provide. And obviously, uh, when selecting tools and technologies, support, comes, uh, support becomes critical. Uh, if, it, if it is a, like a well-known open source project, then obviously you have uh, good community support. If it is not, you need to check whether uh, the tool comes with uh, professional or enterprise support. So number two, automate and orchestrate. So it doesn't matter how big or small you are, uh, you should always have automation in place. There shouldn't be any case where you run uh, things manually for any reason. Everything has to be automated. Image baking has to be automated. Deployment uh, description, like uh, we call it infrastructure as code. You write your you write piece of code to describe your infrastructure. Those stuff has to be automated. Application deployment, service deployment, everything has to be automated. So this enables you having automation adopted in very early stages allows you to scale at any point that you want to. It does not hold back anymore. It does not hold you back anymore, and uh, it will always enable you to go to the next level if you have automation, because it, right today you might be running only two, uh, two instances of uh, WSO2 ESB, for example. But if you have right automate, if you have that automated, and if you if you have right tools integrated around that, it doesn't matter. Maybe next month uh, you will have a need to grow up uh, up to ten instances, and you don't have to worry about that because you already have the capabilities and te technical pieces in place to cater that requirement. Uh, and it does not. It's not just deployment and infrastructure piece. Your tests has to be automated as well. What does that mean? Whenever you deploy your code, uh, whenever you want to deploy your code into the cloud or into the production, there has to be a set of tests that you need to run. If someone is spending uh, hours in front of a computer, typing in things or clicking buttons just to make sure that things, the, your code is working as expected, that's not going to scale. So what you need is a set of automated uh, tests that you can run, maybe a script. It could be a bunch of curl commands. You just have to script it and uh, script it with right messages. If it, pa if it passes, it will say tests are successful. If it doesn't, it will tell you which tests got failed and uh, which one got uh, passed. So having te automated tests is important, again, for one-click deployments. You ran it. You, when you want to deploy your code into production, it will go through your test site suit and then only, if it, only uh, if it goes through all the tests, then it will uh, get deployed to production automatically. And that enables self-healing. What is self-healing? Self-healing is, uh, again, this, uh, this is something like uh, tightly bound to uh, cloud infrastructure services. Um, that means like uh, for some reason, uh, let's say, um, could be for a bug or uh, any other infrastructure-related problem, one of your service components failed to work as expected. And if you have a continuous set of tests running against that, the moment that your test suit detects the problem, it will automatically terminate that piece of instance, that instance, and a replacement will come back immediately, 
a replacement instance will come back immediately. If you have like auto scaling uh, set up, if your tests detect a failure in one instance, if a health check gets failed, uh, your tools can be, should be able to terminate that instance and the, and the auto scaler will be able to spin up a replacement instance and then uh, uh, your application deployment should follow in and then uh, uh, that should heal uh, whatever the problem it was having. So having proper automation and orchestration only allows self-healing. So having all these technology pieces and automation pieces and orchestration pieces in place, now what does human have to do? They can always, fo they can always focus on the improvements. So uh, that's, that will like, make, the, uh, make the team productivity improved, one thing, and that will enable you to always focus on the next level once you have these uh, small bit bits and pieces in place. Number three, maintenance. So maintenance is something that we always do. It can be routine maintenances. Or it, uh, there can be things that we uh, do only um, maybe a couple of times a year, such as upgrades and migrations. So, uh, if, it, if we focus on routine maintenance, it's always best to have well-defined and documented workflows for maintenance work. So um, you need to first plan your maintenance, and then you need to decide a maintenance window, and then you need to update everyone who's involved, uh, starting from developers. Uh, you need to update your uh, teammates, or you, need to, uh, you definitely need to update the end consumers about the maintenance window. And then uh, once you have that, uh, then you actually start the maintenance. You define a uh, window, and you start the maintenance, and then you run your test suit, and when, that, when, the, when everything is OK, uh, you, re you, uh, you release the environment back to production traffic. But if, if things started failing, if things, don't, if things didn't come out good, then you roll back and go to your previous state. So, uh, and the other thing is having fixed maintenance windows always enable you to plan maintenance as well. Fixed maintenance, uh, by fixed maintenance windows, I meant, uh, for example, in WSO2, we have selected Tuesdays and Thursdays only for maintenance work. So that means that, allow, that enables us a couple of things. First thing is it allows us to plan maintenance very well. The second thing is it enables, to, it enables us to stack changes rather than like uh, we are an environment, we are a very dynamic environment that gets lots of change requests. So every time we get a change, if we try to push that into production, there will be like the production environment will not be available in many cases. We, have to, we might have to bring it down, uh, apply the changes, and bring it up. But that's not going to work. So what we do is we stack changes. We try everything in non-production environments, stack the changes. <clears throat> Only if it is a Tuesday or a Wednesday, we have pro properly defined windows, and we push all the changes into production. So having fixed maintenance windows, are important in that aspect. And if you're doing an upgrade or migrations, it's always best to consult an engineer uh, who knows the things and who can give an estimate in terms of effort uh, for the upgrade or the migration required. And then plan it properly, run several drills in a non-production environment, and then uh, go for production. Again, when you're doing upgrades and migrations, script everything. Do not, like, when you, especially when you're running uh, upgrades and migrations against production environments, never keep anything without scripted. Every single command, every database operations has to be scripted, and you just have to run a script, run your set of scripts in a properly defined sequence. Number four, monitoring. So when it comes to monitoring, people always, the popular way of setting up monitoring is uh, you take in a bunch of tools, and then uh, those tools will be most of the time monitoring your resource consumptions, like how much disk space 
a particular application is consuming, or how much of CPU a particular host is consuming, how much of memory or heap a particular application or a host is consuming. Those are the things that people use to monitor all the time. Is that enough? That is important. I'm not saying it's not important. But what is important, what, what is important most is what the end user sees. It does not matter how good, how your resource consumption, how well your applications consume resources. And, uh, if your users cannot perform their work or work on your environment uh, as the way they want to, be, want to work. So it's always best to have some piece of monitoring that simulates user activities and monitor a setup from the end user's point of view. And uh, when setting up alerts, always set up alerts based on severity. You don't need to trigger phone call alerts or SMS alerts for every failure. There can be cases, especially for counter-based alerts, uh, if, you have, uh, the if you have your environment set up with enough uh, number of instances with, uh, in a way that it is highly available, you don't have to worry about counter-based alerts anymore. Counter-based uh, alerts can be displayed in dashboards. Oh, it's enough to get an email for that. If you take a cloud, uh, a cloud deployment, running this space, Run, uh, running a, ho uh, a host running out of this space, that's not a critical problem anymore. Because you can always detect those things at early stages. If a, di if a disk is running, uh, if a disk is consuming 80% of the storage, you can detect that and attend to those things early. You don't need to wait till the last moment and get, uh, get alerts to your uh, mobile phone. So your mobile phone should ring only if an end user cannot perform certain activities in your setup, cannot, perform, cannot, work your, cannot, cannot consume your application uh, as the way it's supposed to work. So that is a critical, that is a cat catastrophic failure. And those are the things that you need to get alerted, really. Everything else can be, uh, dis uh, can be displayed on dashboards, and you can have people to work on, the, work on those stuff before it runs into uh, catastrophic uh, catastrophic level. And dashboards, obviously, uh, very important in that aspect. And uh, having graphs and, uh, and graphical uh, representation of stats enables you to uh, like take decisions prior, like takes decisions in a more productive way, in a more useful way. So for example, if, uh, if, you, if your application is consuming heap, and that usage is growing at an exponential rate, that is something you have to worry about. It will trigger alerts only if it's at a, at a disastrous level. But if you have graphs on the dashboards, you can see it, and you can attend to it beforehand. And the other most critical thing is the post-mortem reports. So post-mortem reports are Im very important. And you need to, like, it's always advisable to carry out postmortems and prepare postmortem reports even internally. There can be failures uh, which are not, which, might, which your end users might not affect it, but still you know something has happened and you need to carry out a postmortem and together with your teammates you need to prepare a postmortem report. And that will certainly help, that helped us a lot in our experience uh, to make sure that we don't run into the same problem uh, again. So if we, if, we, if we encounter with a problem, we fix it, we carry out a postmortem, we prepare a report, and uh, that is, we do it as a collective effort. We collectively prepare the report so that everyone knows what had happened and what we did to fix that. And uh, that helps us uh, to avoid the same thing happening again. Number five, security. So when it comes to security, there are actually, uh, I'm focusing on two aspects, the system security and application security. But there are, of course, infrastructure security, and network security. But since I'm focusing more towards uh, cloud infrastructure environments, uh, I'm not going to uh, like focus about infrastructure and the network security. But when it comes to system security, that could be operating system-related security cases. 
and the application security. So whichever the case, you need to make sure that you apply security updates promptly. If it is an, uh, if it is an operating system update, there are, many, uh, there are many ways you can apply operating system updates. Um, there are tools, if, you are a, if, you are, if your uh, deployment is on uh, Debian or Ubuntu-based flavors, then you can use a tool like Chrome, Chrome APT that will periodically check for updates and uh, it will keep applying those updates. If you're running on Red Hat family environment, you can use uh, yum Chrome, which does the same thing. You can configure yum Chrome with security repos and it will talk to those repos and keep updating your environment only with security updates. And that will make sure that uh, on daily basis, you are listening to updates and if there's anything available, your environment will get updated automatically. And similarly, uh, if you are using WSO2 products uh, in your data center, you can use the WSO2 update manager, which now releases um, the security updates as well as uh, application updates into, in, in, into your environment. So what WAM does is it will listen to you. When you have WAM, it will listen to the update service and if there are any updates available, it will build a pack for you, a new SIP archive for you with the updates. And you can uh, use that SIP archive and deploy uh, in your data center with, and you don't have to worry about security updates or, or any other product related updates anymore. So Samir, my friend, will uh, talk about uh, WSO2 Update Manager, its internals, and how you can run DevOps with WOM uh, in the next talk. And the other thing, uh, other important thing when it comes to security is penetration and vulnerability assessment tests. These tests, again, most of the folks used to consult another party. That's okay. But still, there are so many tools available that you can use internally uh, to make sure that uh, your operating systems are running at a health, healthy state and your applications are operating uh, at a healthy, by healthy I mean like not vulnerable state. And uh, you can adopt those technologies and uh, as part of your automated testing, maybe you can run uh, some of those tests. Like it will smoke through the environment and uh, give some sort of a report uh, so that you can make sure that uh, you are fair at a fairly uh, secure state. But if you need like a, most, uh, like a thorough um, pen or VA test, you can always consult uh, a company or a person who does that and uh, get these things done, but, and it's always advisable to do that uh, at least before you go production with your project. Number six, backups and DR. So uh, backups and disaster recovery is tightly bound to your business continuity plan. So I'm sure all of you, or, or, or the organizations that you represent has a business continuity plan. And uh, that plan describes um, the outage that it can bear, the, what is the maximum outage uh, that your uh, data center or that your project could bear. And based on that, you need to uh, uh, decide your backup strategy. Um, backups, like, that's one aspect. And the second aspect is you need to have some sort of an idea of how fast uh, the, your data is growing and how fast the state of your deployment changes. If it does not change pre, uh, at a frequent rate, if you don't have, if, if, if it just enables users just to um, consume services and it does not perform any database operations, then you can have a very relaxed uh, backup cycle. Maybe taking backups once or twice a day would be enough for you. But if the change rate is very high and if there are so many database level operations happening, for example, then you might have to have some sort of an aggressive backup plan, like taking backups for uh, five or six times a day, maybe. So you have the backup strategy, and based on that, you have the disaster recovery strategy. So you, that again goes together with backups, because in a disaster recovery, what you use is the, uh, uh, the backups you have. So when, when it comes to, so whenever you say you decide on the backup, frequency, um, 
you need to focus on the areas that I just mentioned. It's, and the other thing is you need to make sure that the backups you take, take are at a healthy state. It does not matter how many backups you take or how frequently you take backups. There should be a mechanism to drill and make sure that the backups you take are at a good state. So for that, you need to run frequent drills and make sure you can actually recover from a disaster uh, with the backups you have. And having an idea of RTO and RPO is important. RTO is recovery time objective, which means in a disastrous case, how long it takes for you to recover. And RPO, recovery point objective, means to what point in time you can recover. That means, for example, I can recover for a state uh, like six hour ago state. And how long it takes for me to recover to that state? That is what RPO and RTO means. So uh, when designing a disaster recovery strategy, it's important to focus on these two aspects as well. Number seven, culture and mindset. So this is something that we focus very much at WSO2. Um, Technical, because technical knowledge, technical skills, people can learn those stuff anyway. What is important is to have the right mindset and the right attitude to work in a culture uh, and, have, like, and, and create a culture that enables people to innovate and do creative things. So we, when we are having open discussions all the time. There are uh, email distribution lists that we use for every discussion. And we always encourage people to jump into whatever discussions and, uh, and participate and uh, throw their ideas um, without holding them back. So that is one thing we encourage all the time. And the other thing we encourage is uh, don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness. And that will enable people to do innovative things, try out different things. And if it fails, that's fine. We, we, won't, we won't do that again. We will try something different now. And um, the other thing is trust, but verify. Yes, obviously we trust all our people, but at the same time there should be a mechanism to verify that what they do, and that will help both. Both that will help uh, uh, the person who work on something, and that will he help the organization on the other st uh, on the other side um, to make sure that uh, we don't run into um, trouble situations. And dependability and accountability is, again, obviously important. Uh, we should be able to depend on people when it comes to uh, task. When we hand over a task to someone, we are dependent on him. And we, 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 there, should be, um, there should be a trust uh, that uh, that person will deliver that task no matter what. And uh, always there's uh, no room for blaming or finger pointing. If someone, do, if, if someone does something great, yes, we are, of course acknowledge that person and we appreciate it. But if things go wrong, we take that responsibility collectively. And uh, that, that will ensure that people will not do things, people will not take risks. And uh, uh, if, if, if we don't have this uh, enforced, people will, people will be like, People will not do, will, will not accept challenges. People will not do creative things. So we encourage them, and uh, we want them to fail, and uh, we want them to learn out of that. And uh, we, at the same time, we want them to uh, success by not doing uh, that things that could go wrong. And obviously, the right attitude. Right attitude is, uh, that's I think obvious to everyone, like uh, the attitude to listen to other people and, uh, and attitude uh, to learn things and uh, being open for criticisms. So those kind of things that we always uh, enforce on people and uh, we expect them to uh, cultivate those type of qualities. So finally, uh, WSO2 offers a public cloud service, as well as the managed cloud service. And uh, for both these services, uh, both these services are carried out uh, by the cloud team. And uh, DevOps is part of the cloud team. And uh, you can talk to myself or Dimitri here uh, about these services and uh, 
if you are interested or if you want to know anything, any, uh, any details about these things, you can always uh, talk to Dimitri or myself. Thank you.